You ever get one of those crazy emails that has an image like this? And then it says, what do you see first? And then like down at the bottom, it starts telling you what kind of brain you have based upon what you see first. You know what I'm talking about? And I'm like, oh, I feel like so judged and trapped and like, you know, you're telling me what, you know, like well, your creative brain, a right brain, a left brain, or what, you know, whatever it is based upon like what you see. What do you guys, who, go, discuss, discuss where you are among yourselves what you see next to the person that you're sitting with. What do you see? How many of you see the back of a head and somebody looking out in the distance? Oh, that's the smart chronometer. <laughs> how, many, how many of you see somebody smoking? Anybody? Oh, okay, I see. I see what you see. Uh huh. <laughs> how, many of you, how many of you see the giraffe? No, there's not a giraffe in that one. I don't think so. I don't think so. All right, what about this next one? What about this next one? All right, can you see it? You see it? You see the picture of what we think Jesus looks like, you know? Because we know, right? <laughs> do, do you see it right there in the middle? A little bit, a little bit. In, in, in our text this morning, in Luke chapter 19, we see a man that was trying really, really hard to see Jesus. So I want you to find your way to Luke 19, if you're not there. Luke chapter 19. And we see this event in Jesus' life where this man was trying really, really hard to see Jesus. So I want you to follow along as I read from Luke chapter 19, picking up in verse 1. He entered Jericho and was passing through. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. And he was seeking to see who Jesus was. But on account of the crowd, he could not because he was small in stature. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was about to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all grumbled. He has gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house since he is also a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Would you pray with me? Father, we pray in Jesus' name and by your Spirit that you would speak to us personally and powerfully through your sacred, sacred scriptures, Lord. Speak to us, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The first thing we see this morning, and in my notes, I just call Zacchaeus Zach because it's just a little easier. Um, but Zach was seeking Jesus. Jack was, Zach was seeking Jesus. He, he climbs up in a tree so he could get his eyes on Jesus to see who Jesus was. He was seeking to see Jesus. You know, when I observe life, I see that there's a lot of different things that kind of propel people into seeking Jesus. Um, sometimes uh, people find themselves in a divorce, and something about the divorce leads them into this kind of new season of life where they, they decide, okay, I'm coming out of this, and I'm going to seek Jesus in a fresh way. Sometimes people, it's, they lose a loved one. A loved one dies, and, and there's something about losing a loved one that it, it, it sobers you and sometimes causes you to think about what matters most in life, and sometimes people begin to seek Jesus in, in that way. Sometimes it's like financial ruin. Somebody has just like a financial disaster and they just at the end of their rope financially. And, and when they hit that spot, they begin to seek Jesus in a fresh way. And don't you love it when somebody begins to seek Jesus just because of the, the consistent witness of a coworker or a friend or a neighbor? It's like they've watched their character on display for a long time. 
They've watched them in tough situations. They've watched them respond to stress. And after watching them for a long time, it doesn't happen immediately, but sometimes after watching a Christian live their life for a long time, they begin to get curious and they begin to have questions and they begin to want to come and listen and and read the Bible. And it's always cool when that happens. Um, Sometimes it's when people move to a new town. It's like fresh start, new town, new friends, new neighborhood, new everything. You know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to embrace a new spiritual journey, and people begin a new spiritual journey. Oftentimes, it happens when people have kids. Have you seen this? You know, it's like maybe somebody kind of grew up in the church. They grew up learning about the Lord, but it's when they have a kid, they're like, oh, no, now I'm not just responsible for me. I'm responsible for them, too. I better give them a chance to know God and get them in church and let you know and so there's a number of things that that propel people into seeking Jesus we don't know we don't know why Zacchaeus was seeking Jesus this day we don't know all that he had heard about Jesus um, we don't know what he had been taught about Jesus we just know that he was seeking Jesus but don't miss this before Zacchaeus was seeking Jesus Jesus was seeking Jesus Zacchaeus. Look at, look at verse 1 with me again. Chapter 19, verse 1. He entered Jericho and was passing through. Where did he enter? Jericho. Where did Zacchaeus live? Jericho. But we, we see that Jesus' seeking was intentional. He went through Jericho. Zacchaeus was in Jericho. And if we went around the room this morning, for those of us that are followers of Jesus, we would all tell these stories about how the Lord got our attention, who the Lord put us in contact with, or the life situation that the Lord used to kind of wake us up, right? We would all have a story about how the Lord pursued us, how the Lord sought us, how the Lord spoke to us. We would, we would tell it it happened in this place or at this time, or he used this person or this Bible verse that I, I memorized as a kid. The Holy Spirit began to speak to me through it in my young 20s. Or All of us would have these stories about how the Lord was seeking us, and we see here indeed Jesus was seeking Zacchaeus. It's actually really amazing when you consider the kind of person Zacchaeus was. Um, We see that Jesus was seeking him intentionally. We also see that Jesus was seeking him relationally. One of our values here at Real Life is grace and truth in relationships. In other words, our values answer the kind of the question of um, what kind of ministry are we going to have? What kind of church are we going to be? And we want to be a church that's marked by grace and truth in in relationships. In other words, church isn't an event to come to. It's a family to belong to. It's a family where you grow in relationships, where you're known and people know you. You're encouraged and people encourage you. And we see here Jesus seeking Zacchaeus in a, in a relationship. He calls him by name. Don't you hate when people misspell your name? <laughs> I, I do. Like when I get the IE, you know, here's what's funny. Sometimes I'll send an email and at the bottom of my email, there's an email signature and like my name is spelled F-R-E-D-D-Y. And then they'll reply to that email where it's spelled right in the beginning. They'll reply spelling it F-R-E-D-D-I-E. You know, does anybody else have a name that's commonly misspelled? And you're like, could you just get my name right, please? And you know, and like and when somebody, maybe you've got like a weird name to pronounce, you know, and you, you were the kid that every year you had to correct the teacher. Do you know what I'm talking about? Anybody there? Yeah, I don't. Yep. Yeah, thank you, mom and dad, for the weird name, right? You know, it's like you didn't get to choose that name. You know, you can change your name legally. You can do that, you know. Maybe, maybe that's for somebody this morning. I don't know. <laughs> Jesus called Zacchaeus by his name. They hadn't met, but Jesus knew him. Maybe, maybe you're here today and, and you haven't yet met Jesus. He knows you. The Bible says that God knows the numbers of hairs on our head. He knows your deepest fears, hopes, and dreams. He loves you. He knows your worst, most evil, dark thoughts. He loves you. Jesus called Zacchaeus by name. Jesus was seeking Zacchaeus relationally. And and what did he say to you? He said, come on down from the tree. I must go to your house today. And in those days, going into someone's home was like uh, intimate fellowship and relationship. 
If you went into someone's home in this, in this way, it signified this relational acceptance. It, it signified this, I'm with you, I'm for you. There's an intimacy about our relationship when you go into someone's home, and that's where Jesus wanted to go. He wanted to go into Zacchaeus' home. <laughs> Why is this so stunning? Well, Zacchaeus, the scripture tells us, was a tax collector. He was a chief tax collector. And tax collectors were hated in those days because they were lying, thieving tax collectors. They would cheat about what people owed and they would take money that they shouldn't have taken money and they would get rich. And that's exactly what the scripture says. Luke said he was, he was rich. He was a chief tax collector. He was, he was despised. It, this is interesting because um, <laughs> Zacchaeus, it said he was short in stature. He was so short that he had, to, he had to climb a tree to be able to get his eyes on Jesus. And I don't know if you experienced this growing up, but like if you've got something that's just like not the normal about your physical features, kids can be so cruel, can't they? It's brutal. When I was growing up, you guys, I had one eyebrow. <laughs> I'm serious, like one eyebrow, one eyebrow. When I got into, I, got my, I was getting my hair cut in college, and, and the lady that was cutting my hair, she said, can I do something for you? <laughs> I said, is it my eyebrow? She said, it'll only take a second. I do it to my boyfriend all the time. You know, it's like, go ahead. She waxes my eyebrow, and I go back over to our campus ministry, and all the girls are like, it looks so good. It looks so good. I'm like, why didn't you tell me it looked so bad to begin with? You know, it's like. When I was in, when I was in middle school, we would play basketball, and, and literally the kids had a song that they made up about my one eyebrow. And uh, I, I know, I have two right now. It's a little shave, right? I learned in college. Boom, there you go. But they, and literally, like the song, like, it was like one, you know, and like, like that was the theme of the song, one, you know, making fun of, I had no idea they were making fun of my eyebrow until finally somebody said, you know. So here Zacchaeus is, and you know, like I can shave my eyebrow, but he can't grow himself to be taller, right? And so you just imagine what were the cruel jokes? What were the cruel nicknames that they had for Zacchaeus growing up? So, so, here you, so here you have a man, here you have a man who was ridiculed as a kid, likely, right? We can only imagine. He was so short, he had to get up in a tree just to see over the crowd. So nicknames, that was his journey growing up. And now he has a vocation that has him hated. Ostracized as a kid, ostracized as an adult, and Jesus wanted to go into his home. Wanted to go into his, into his home. Some of you here this morning, you feel like Zacchaeus. You feel ostracized for whatever reason. Maybe it was a journey growing up. Maybe it was how you acted and brought things upon yourself. Whatever it is, somehow you feel like you've alienated yourself or you have found yourself alienated. And it is good news for you to hear that Jesus wants to come into your life, into the intimate place in your life. It is welcome news. It lifts your spirit to think that Jesus cares about you and wants to be involved in your life today. Others of us are like, like the crowd. What did the, what did the crowd do? <laughs> the crowd grumbled that Jesus was going into that intimate place, the home. And they, they described him as a sinner. His reputation was well known. That's who he was known as, a sinner. Isn't it interesting? I'm, I'm just curious if, you, if this happens for you. But you have those, um, <laughs> you have these concepts of like normal sinners and extreme sinners. Do you, do you have these concepts? Like here's all the normal sinners. And like somehow we're comfortable in our mind and heart thinking that Jesus died for the normal sinners. But, but here's these people whose reputations are absolutely trash because of who they are and what they do. They're, like, they're known by everybody as ostracized, nobody loves them, nobody likes them, everybody hates them because of what they do. Do you have a, do you have a category that, like, Jesus' love is for, for normal sinners but not extreme sinners? Isn't, isn't that silly? <laughs> um, the, the scripture says, that while we were yet sinners, God demonstrated his own love for us. That while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. What would, what would cause us, what would cause us to think 
that there's like normal sinners and extreme sinners? What would cause us to categorize sinners? What would cause us to do that? Self-righteousness, which itself is a sin. It was the sin of the religious leaders, the Pharisees, and Jesus rebuked that sin all the time. So, so what would cause you to think that there's like some sort of degree of sinners? What would cause any of us to think that there's some sort of degree of sinners? What would cause us to think that? Self-righteousness. I'm less of a sinner than they are. That only happens when we compare ourselves to other people and not compare ourselves to our holy maker. Do you see how silly that is? Like, it's like we, we end up like in this kind of comparison of... Well, all the people saw Zacchaeus in that way. They saw him as a wicked sinner, so much so that they described him that way, so much so that they grumbled that Jesus went into his house. You understand that the essence of grace is that it's undeserved. Have you ever, have you ever like, been in an argument with somebody that like, really did you wrong and you had trouble forgiving them? And you had somebody like try to talk you into forgiving them? And your response to this person trying to talk you into forgiving them was all the reasons why they don't deserve to be forgiven. <laughs> you, ever, you ever found yourself in that way? And it's like, you got your case, man. You got your 10 reasons and then some of like, here's all the reasons why they don't deserve to be forgiven. And we just lose sight of the fact that, that no, like that's the whole point of grace and forgiveness is that the essence of it is that it's undeserved. So you're right, they don't deserve it, that's why we give it, that's why God sent Jesus, because none of us deserved it. He wanted to show us his grace. So, so Jesus was seeking Zacchaeus and he was seeking him intentionally, it didn't happen by chance, and he was seeking him relationally, going into his home. Dear friends, Jesus doesn't just want to forgive you today, he wants to have a real relationship with you, a real friendship. A real devoted love relationship where you let, you let him speak to you through the sacred scriptures every day. Where you cry out to him and you cast your burdens on Jesus. He wants a real relationship with you and me today. It's interesting, Jesus was seeking Zach and he was seeking him intentionally and he was seeking him relationally. But he was seeking him with an urgency. He said, I must come to your house today. I must. Zacchaeus, hurry. Come down. I must come to your house today. Do you feel that way about getting the gospel to anybody? Do you love any of your friends, your coworkers, your family? Do you love any people that are far from God with such an urgency that you wake up feeling like, I must share the good news with them? I must get them to church. That's why I like to say bring people to church with you rather than invite people to church with you, you know? Why? Because there's an urgency. Heaven and hell are real. God is true. He looks upon us. And forgiveness and grace is available. There's an urgency. There's an urgency. And Jesus said, I must come to your house today. The last little thing that we see in Jesus' seeking of Zacchaeus is that it was criticized. It was criticized. You know that we can do everything right the way God wants us to do it, and we could still be criticized. You know that you can get your life totally on board with the Lord and walk in the Lord's ways and, and sometimes the crowd and sometimes even religious people will criticize you. That's what happened to Jesus. He was doing exactly what he was bringing his grace to an undeserved sinner and people criticized him. And today he brings his grace to us. He demonstrated his grace through the cross. He, he bore our sins. He stood in our place as our substitute. Undeserved, he took the judgment of God so that we could get the mercy of God. So that we can be forgiven and free and filled with hope and joy. So that we can have a relationship with God and be reconciled with him. Jesus did the unthinkable. When Jesus was hanging on the cross, listen, he was seeking us. What I love about this, about this event is that Zacchaeus received Jesus. He received Jesus. Look at this with me back in the text in Luke chapter 19. Look at verse 5. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and he said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. Verse 6, so he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. How, how do we know? How do we know that Zacchaeus received Jesus? Well, the first indicator is he received him with joy. In other words, like Jesus wasn't like twisting his arm. There was an urgency, but it wasn't like, 
I've got to convince you. I've got to twist your arm, right? It, Zacchaeus was not receiving Jesus like dutifully. He was receiving him joyfully. Listen, some of you, some of you, you've tried to live out a religious life out of duty because you thought that's what God demanded. Today, you can trash religion and you can receive Jesus and receive a relationship with him. No more living out of guilt and duty but joyfully receiving him. That was the first indicator. That was the first indicator that, that Zacchaeus was receiving him. But look at the text with me and let's see the rest. Uh, verse 7, And when they saw it, they all grumbled. He has gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord. Let's just pause there. <laughs> who does he say Jesus is? Lord. Just a few verses earlier, Zacchaeus was climbing up in the tree just to see who Jesus was, Luke said. He, he was just trying to see who Jesus was. And in a moment, something changed for Zacchaeus. And he said, okay, whoever I thought you to be, Jesus, now you're Lord. Do you remember when that happened for you? Maybe, some, maybe for somebody, today is your day. Maybe for somebody here today, you're like, I'm done with living my life, my way, with my wisdom and my strength. I need a new king. I need a new master. And I see Jesus. He really is the son of God. He really did love me. He really does love me. He really did die for me and rise again. Eternal life is available. Jesus, you are Lord. Jesus, you are Lord. Somebody here today needs to say, Jesus, I'm no longer Lord. You, you are Lord. And it can be the person with the worst reputation in the room. You can make Jesus your Lord today. Today. Right now. That's who Zacchaeus was. The one with the worst reputation in the crowd. And he made Jesus his Lord. But let's be careful. Listen. Let's be careful. Because it's easy to give lip service to Jesus. It's easy to sing songs and not mean it in your heart. It's easy to make empty promises that we don't follow through on, right? So how do, how do we know that, that, I, that Zacchaeus was truly receiving Jesus as, as his Lord? Was it because he said Lord? Look at the text with me. Verse 8, And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord. So he calls him Lord, but what does he do with his living? What does he do with his life? Look at the rest of the verse. The half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. What was the evidence? What was the evidence that Zacchaeus was a follower of Jesus? What was the evidence that Zacchaeus was born again? What was the evidence that Zacchaeus would be what we call today a Christian? What was the evidence? Well, he received him joyfully. But we've all known people that have received the Lord joyfully and then went off and lived a life where there was no evidence that Jesus was the Lord of their life. He, he received him joyfully and he called him Lord. And we all know people that have received Jesus joyfully. They prayed a prayer calling him Lord, but then went and lived a life where it was clear that Jesus was not their Lord. What was the evidence? The evidence was he received Jesus as his Lord, and he began to live a life that demonstrated that Jesus was the Lord of his life, not he was the Lord of his life. When, listen, when Zacchaeus was the Lord of his life, he lied to get money to make himself rich. And when Jesus was the Lord of his life, he began to do the right thing with his money. Generosity sprang up from his heart. He gave half of what he had to the poor. And he said, anybody that I defrauded, anybody that I stole from, I'm going to give them four times as much of what, what I took from them, four times as much. So, so is there evidence today? Let's, let's, just, let's, just start, let's just start with money. Let's start with where Zacchaeus was. Is there evidence today in our lives that we're a follower of Jesus by how we use our money? Is there evidence in that? Can, can you look at your bank account and see how you're investing in the purposes of God financially? Some of you are brand new Christians, and you don't yet know that God cares about how you use your money, that he wants you to give and invest in his purposes and in his mission. And, um, and, and here we see a little snapshot in Zacchaeus' life. What did, what did Jesus say? What did Jesus say after Zacchaeus gave half of his good, pledge to give half of his goods to the poor? And then, and then 
decided to, to give fourfold. What did, what did Jesus say? He said, today, salvation has come to your house. That's, he's saying, I'm looking at your life, and I see that your heart is transformed, because that's, that's when we're saved. Our heart is transformed. I see that your heart is transformed by how you're living. So, so has Jesus changed your heart? Has, has Jesus changed your, your heart today? Has he lavished his grace upon you? Has he touched your heart by his spirit with his love? Are you a Christian? Are you a follower of Jesus? It'll be evidenced in how you honor the Lord in your money. If you're a brand new Christian and you're like, well, what does he require of me? Let's talk. Let's open up the scripture so we can show you. But I just encourage you today, take a step toward generosity. Begin to give to the Lord and his purposes today. But, but what about the other areas of our life? Is there evidence that Jesus, the Son of God, is living inside of us? You know, I'm encouraged by what one old theologian said. He said, all of life is repentance. <laughs> I love that because it's like every day, every day I walk intimately with the Lord, the Lord shows me more sin in my life that I need to repent of. Do you feel that way? Do you experience that? Anybody? It's like the closer you get to the Lord, the more you realize, oh my goodness, I've fallen so, so short of, of what you want for me. And, and the beauty is, is that God's love and grace is an unending waterfall through his son, Jesus Christ. <laughs> and, when, and when you turn to and trust in Jesus, you place your life squarely under the unending waterfall of his love and grace, and it never runs dry. It's every day. Every day, in all your shortcomings, in all your sins, in all your mistakes, and in all your brokenness, there's an unending waterfall. Listen, that's the goodness of Jesus Christ. That's the goodness of God the Father. That's the power of the Holy Spirit in us, friends. That's why we worship Him, right? That's why we sing songs about the Lord, is because it's just unspeakably good what God has done in His great love for us. So don't miss this. Zach was seeking Jesus. And Jesus was seeking Zach, and Zach received Jesus. But don't miss this, Jesus is seeking us. Jesus is seeking us. When we begin to see with spiritual sight, we begin to see how God is pursuing us. Sometimes he allows us to move in next door to a neighbor who's a believer, who begins to live a distinctive, different life than what we live, and we notice something different. Sometimes it's just that we're born into a Christian home, like, wow, every day we get to hear the gospel sown into our life, and that's God in his grace seeking us because we didn't choose what home we were born into, and we could have been born into a, any number of homes, but we were born into this home, and the Father is seeking us through the, the family and the upbringing that we have. A friend invites us to church, and we understand God is seeking me through, through this friend's invitation. Every day, the sun rises and the sun sets. And the Bible tells us that God is actually speaking through his creation. That when we see the sunrise and when we see the sunset, it's the God who made it speaking to us and revealing things to us about who he is. And so every day when we wake up and we see the sunrise and every day when the day is done and we see the sunset, God is seeking you. Some of you today, you, you kind of came in with all these objections to why God would not be interested in you. All these things that you just maybe disbelieve that God is interested in you. Friends, when you, when you see the sunrise tomorrow and when you see the sunset, here in the deepest part of your soul, God loves you and he's seeking you. So my question is, have you received him? Have you received him? Let's pray together. Let's pray. And just with your heads bowed and your eyes closed as our worship team comes to, to help us to respond this morning, I just want to ask you, if you want to open up your heart in faith like Zacchaeus did that day, and if you want to make Jesus the Lord of your life and receive him as the Lord of your life, I just want to give you an opportunity right now to, to speak that out. Later in this text, Jesus said, he, the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. And in our sin, we're all lost, but the good news is Jesus wants to save us. He'll save you today if you trust in him. So just in the quietness of this moment, if, if you want to cry out to Jesus, 
and receive him as the Lord of your life, if you want to receive the forgiveness of your sins and the grace that God offers you through Jesus, would you just pray a prayer something like this? God, I know I'm a sinner. Just quietly in your heart. In Jesus, I need you to save me and be the Lord of my life. Please come in and forgive me. Come into my life and be my Lord. I trust you. I need you. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your grace. And just with everyone's head bowed and eye closed this morning, if you prayed that prayer and cried out to Jesus this morning for the first time with faith in your heart, would you just look up at me and raise your hand? I just want to know. I just want to pray for you and celebrate with you. I see you, brother. Anybody else? You prayed and cried out to Jesus, trusting in him, receiving him as your Lord. Anybody else this morning? Anybody else? Thank you, Lord. Yes, Lord. Father, we thank you for your great love. We thank you, oh God, for your great grace. We thank you, Lord, that you look upon those of us with the worst reputations and you want to come into into the living room of our heart. God, we'll never get over your great love. Thank you for seeking us. Thank you for saving us. We love you, Lord, in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen, amen. Church, it feels good to have your heart cleansed by the blood of Jesus, doesn't it? Church, it feels good to... To hear the declaration that there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. It feels good to to be a little lighter in this place, doesn't it? Our sin and our shame is a burden that we're not to bear because he bore it. So let's stand to our feet. Let's declare he's worthy in this place. Let's declare he's king. Let's declare our love for him and his love for us. Amen? Amen. Amen.